our series in the book of Jeremiah, one of those seldom looked at books, and we're going to go through the entire book, but we're going to do it kind of in bits and pieces. We're not going to do it um, completely verse by verse like we've done with some, but we're going to look at it from a perspective of how does the warnings that Jeremiah prophesied about to the nation of Israel and Judah during the years in which he was a prophet correlate with warnings for us today. Now it's going to to a certain extent kind of look like I'm trying to take it and say that all these warnings can be applied directly to America because the Bible is talking about America. No, that's not it. Don't. We're not going there. Because this could because I use a lot of American history in this study, you could also do the same thing with the history of Germany or of England or whatever. It would all fit. So it's interesting when you look at world history and you see the way that things have developed over the centuries. There's one interesting fact that most people never really truly realize. Did you realize that every successful nation since probably or somewhere around the 1700s and going forward have been a Christian foundation? And not only that, but also a Protestant foundation. You won't find one that varies from that. You say, well, what about Japan? Because Japan became a very successful nation early on. It was all founded by the reconstruction that was done by the Americans after the Second World War, which was based on Christian principles. But you will find there's no nation in the world that has become successful, you might say in the true sense, that didn't have that foundation. Now, the problem is they get away from it. Europe, especially Western Europe, is horrid. My native land of my ancestors, which is the Netherlands, um, when I say um, when my mother was young, because that she grew up there, um, there still was a lot of active churches. By the time she went back there, when she was in her probably in her 50s, her and my dad went back there and visited. The huge churches are all still there, but on a Sunday morning there might be five people in it. I mean, these are churches that seat 300 people. Somebody is still supporting them, but the people aren't there. And they have gone so far away. Now, the United States is following. We know that. So I'm not going to, like I said, I don't, I don't want to get into a whole lot of it. And, and believe me, I don't want to get into saying that America, again, is the prophesied book or country here. Is this not? But there's a lot of teaching that Jeremiah has as warnings to us. So I'm going to take a little, real quickly, I want to go through some early American history that just helps us to see what happened that we may not even know about. So I ran across some really interesting stuff. In 1892, the Supreme Court of the United States declared America is a Christian nation. I never heard that before. The Supreme Court actually declared it. Yeah, there, there, was a, there was a lawsuit, um, and this was the... Now going back before that, way back before that, Spanish explorers who followed Columbus in various expeditions brought chaplains. The French were equally zealous about the missionary efforts during the early explorations. The same deep religious spirit permeated in early English settlers in North America. Virtually every group of people that sent out explorers to the New World brought pastors, chaplains, missionaries with them. That was part of what they did. That was part of their, what they felt, part of what they needed to do. A colony was established by the Virginia Company of London as a business enterprise. And in 1609, the company published a little booklet on the purpose and ends of the plantation beginning in Virginia. In their pamphlet, they stated the first objective as to preach and baptize into the Christian religion and by proclamation of the gospel to recover out of the arms of the devil a number of poor and miserable souls wrapped up into death in almost invincible ignorance and to add to the treasury of heaven. We wouldn't hear that today. On the headstone of William Bradford, 
what our fathers with so much difficulty obtain do not basely relinquish wise words when the first shots were fired in 1775 the colonies didn't even have a military eight years later the United States defeated England all of these things happened because of God's direction and God's hand there is no doubt whatsoever if you take a close look at our history and you can apply this like I said to many other nations around the world it is definitely the hand of God that was involved in it and to get the result that we got that huge blessing of having this nation and all the freedoms and privileges that came with it this was God giving us this huge gift and we can lose it God gave Israel a huge gift and they lost it. Oh, they're, they're, I mean, I guess I, I could spend the, the rest of the day up here going over this stuff. I just, like I said, I just want to get a little piece of it. Just to get, to get it set in that we understand that this nation exists because of the people of God turning to him for direction. And this nation was established by his guidance. Um, and like I said, it's not just this nation. There's plenty of others. So now to the book of Jeremiah, chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. So who is Jeremiah? The words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkah, of the priests who were in Enos, in the land of Benjamin, to whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah, the son of Anan, king of Judah, in the thirteenth year of his reign. Jeremiah was a priest, to start with. When he was called, he was a priest, and he became a prophet. And then it was the timing of the nation of Judah at that time was when the reign of Josiah. We're going to look a little bit at Josiah. See, when Jeremiah started, I say, as a prophet, Josiah was 21 years old. And when he was 26 years old, the book of the law was found in the temple because they decided to clean the temple out and they found the book of the law. And believe it or not, it would be kind of like the church has been used for all these other activities for a long period of time and then somebody comes in and says, we're going to give it a good cleaning and they find the Bible. That's what happened, literally is what happened. But he was killed at the age of 39. Now, in 2 Kings 22, verses 1 and 2, Josiah was eight years old when he became king, and he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Jedidiah, the daughter of Adhiah of Boskath. He did right in the sight of the Lord and walked in the way of his father David, nor did he turn aside to the right or to the left. The nation of Israel and Judah had gone downhill in sin so far. I mean, terrible things had been going on. This king at eight years old becomes king of course he's not doing a whole lot of ruling at eight years old that's just not logical but by the time he was in his early 20s he started interesting thing you think okay now we, we we have this problem in this country if we only would elect this guy to be president if we only had this senator if we only had these representatives and if we had this and we had that everything would be just wonderful and all this bad stuff would go away not true Josiah was a good king. Josiah, Josiah was a God-fearing king in a nation that had gone so deep in depravity that uh, because he was king, he got rid of a lot of it. And the people said, oh yeah, we're, you know, you're, you're a good king and we're going to follow and we're going to do things right from now on. They didn't. It was not a revival. God gave them an opportunity to turn. He gave them everything they needed to be instructed, to learn, to build up, and to, to once again turn from their wickedness back to him. And they just did it outwardly. But there was no changing of hearts. But then I find it interesting, and uh, you can almost throw a little political jive into here. D nor did he turn to the right or to the left. He wasn't a Republican. He wasn't a Democrat. 
straight up the middle. I like that line. <laughs> Nobody else knows I did. Okay. This is a few things that he did. He had the book of the law read to the people, burned the vessels that were made for Baal, for, us, for the Asherah, and for the host of heaven. Burned the altars that Ahaz, the Manasseh, had built. He also broke down the houses of the male cult, prostitutes, which were in the house of the Lord, where the women were weaving hangings for the Asherah. They were yet literally using the church for a place for prostitution and for making things for false gods. We haven't gone that far yet. But then again, we're, there's things that are going on in some of the churches today that would almost fall in that category. He also defiled Tobeth, which is the valley of the sun and Hinnom, that no man might make his son or his daughter pass through the fire of Moloch. Now, Tobeth, or Tophet actually is how it's pronounced, um, actually means hearth of shame. The hearth of shame was the, um, there was a, uh, an idol to Moloch that had a big opening in the belly that they would light a fire in and then throw babies into it as a sacrifice. Now, we do that today. Abortion is no different. But it's taking, you know, and, and they did this, and Josiah had these places tore down. And it's interesting, it's in the Valley of Hinnom. And throughout Scripture, you will find that that is a desolate, evil place. There is a tremendous amount of evil that's associated with that area. Chapter 2, verse 2. Go and proclaim in the ears of Jerusalem, saying, Thus says the Lord. See, now Jeremiah is called. And he's commanded to prophesy. I remember concerning you the devotion of your youth, the love of your betrothed, your following after me in the wilderness through the land not sown. God is saying you know, to the people, remember when you were young how devoted you were, how devoted you were to me. You did put, did put me first. When I brought you out of Egypt, you know, and you were settled into the land, the promised land, and you were devoted. Now, were they devoted 100% all the time? No, they weren't. But far more so was that the norm than the other. Far more so were the people in this country devoted at the beginning than now. The devotion of your youth, the love of your betrothed. In other words, this whole concept of this marriage between the church and the Lamb of God how we are the bride and we turn to the groom who is Jesus and we have this union that is, let me say, where, where marriage is kind of built off of that same concept so that we have this connection that is so unique he said, you remember when you had that? you're following after me in the wilderness the following after me in the wilderness, the children of Israel throughout the wilderness where they lived on the manna and the quail and the water out of the rock and all the things that had happened and how they would fall away but then they would always come back and then they this nation would fall away and it comes back. It has done it throughout our history of this nation a number of times. We had the great awakening in the 1600s um, there was another one prior to that um, but there has been changes. There's been ups and downs. But God is just declaring, you said you're going to follow me. Now we can take this from a national standing to a personal standing. We say, Lord, I love you. I want to follow you. I want to do your will. I want to live for you. And we are, get all fired up and we do it for a while and then things happen in life and we slowly start drifting away from it to the point to where all of a sudden I, you know, I remember I used to do this stuff but uh, somehow or another I got away from it I used to attend church all the time now I don't ever go anymore 
and slowly on we fall away. It's part of our evil nature. It's part of what we have a tendency to do unless we continue to stand firm and stand strong and we can see the benefits. That's the part that is so baffling for most everybody. We can see the great benefits there is in following our God and yet we still are able to walk away from it. I can't even understand that and I'm as guilty as anybody. It doesn't make any sense, but we do it. It's because we have that nature in us that is so evil. It's still there. Chapter 2, verse 3. Israel was, was holy to the Lord, the first of his harvest. All who ate of it became guilty. Evil came upon them, declares the Lord. That's almost an interesting little verse there. All who ate of it became guilty. It's all who participated, all who received these blessings and turned away from them. The guilt is built up higher and higher. We've seen it in our lives. We've seen it in our, in our country. We've seen it in this world. The blessings that come. And we enjoy the blessings. We enjoy them to the point to where we're just relishing and, and just, wow, I mean, I really like the way it is. I don't, and look, look what I've done. Look what I've accomplished. Forgetting, you accomplished nothing. I've accomplished nothing. God gave this to me. So that in the guilt of the that happens, the sin that happens because I received blessings, but what I'm doing is I'm turning it away from giving God the praise for it. And I'm starting to bring it upon myself. Like I accomplished this. They're right. But in your case, it would be a woman, right? Yeah, we're going to keep this gender thing clear. I mean, we, we don't want to get confused on that either now. Verse 4 and 5. Hear the word, O Lord, O house of Jacob, and all the families of the house of Israel. Thus says the Lord, What injustice did your fathers find in me that they went far from me and walked after emptiness and became empty? God is turning to the nation of Israel and turning to us and saying, What did I do that caused you to go away? Show me. God, God is literally saying, show me what I've done wrong. And you can, and then you can, there's your excuse of why you turned away from me. Now, of course, we can't find anything God did wrong because God doesn't do any wrong. But he's kind of laying that out there and saying, you know, what injustice? Come up with an excuse. Come up with something. Or did you just of your own just wander away? It doesn't make any sense again. We stop and think about it. It makes no sense. Why would we take, and we've got all these blessings, we're kind of like a people that kill the golden goose. Every day we get that golden egg. Now, I want a bunch more, so I'm going to get inside that goose and get all of them out. You know, obviously it doesn't work that way. We do the same thing. This nation does the same thing. Other nations do the same thing. And walk after emptiness and become empty. See, we're chasing after things that have no meaning, that have no fulfillment, that have no true joy. We chase after fun at the expense of joy. The dangerous place to be. Verse 7, I brought you into fruitful land to eat its fruit and its good things. But you came and defiled my land, and my inheritance you made an abomination. Take a look at all these blessings and use them for self. Not remembering where they came from. The house we have, the heat we have, the air conditioning we have, the transportation we have, it's unlike anything the world has ever seen. The food we have in abundance, the health care that is better than ever before. Far less labor is needed to provide for our daily needs than ever before. You see, if you take the economy and you look at it from perspective, okay, instead of looking at comparing dollars, how much it costs then and how much it costs now, the better way to look at that is how many hours of labor does it take to obtain this? There are so many things that have gone down so drastically in cost, when, especially when you use labor as your you take your average wage, so how many hours does it take to buy this thing? So because a brand new television in 19, 
late 40s, early 50s, ran about 300 bucks. It was black and white, and had tubes and all this stuff, okay? And, and it was fairly small, okay? Today, you can, for 300 bucks, you can buy a pretty nice TV. How many hourly wage in those days was less than a dollar an hour, and now the average wage is basically between 15 and 20. So the number of hours difference is huge. And so many other things fall in that same way. We receive all these blessings, and so what do we do? We take all these blessings and we turn them into an abomination. For those that are old enough, when the radio came out, that was just of the devil, that was evil. And then television, and then the internet, okay? All of these things you know, themselves are just things. It's how they're used. The radio, you may say, with what originally would be, and all the good that it could do, but then all the evil it also could do. Same thing with television, and then of course the internet takes it to the next level. I mean, we use the internet all the time. I do a lot of my research and my studying because I can, I can get all these books online and a lot of reading, but there's also a whole lot of stuff on the internet that I need to stay far away from. That's an abomination. So we can take this blessing of the internet as an example, and we can turn it into an abomination. The internet itself is neutral. It's a thing. It's like dirt. It has no good or bad. It's just that. It's just it. It's what we do with it that matters. Verse 8, the priest did not say, where is the Lord? And those who handled the law did not know me. The rulers also transgressed against me. And the prophets prophesied by Baal and, and walked after the things that did not profit. The priest say, did not say, where is the Lord? In other words, there was no preacher getting up there and calling out, repent, come to know the Lord. It was done no more. That was over. And those that handled the law did not know me. In other words, those that were preaching and teaching didn't even know who God was in the reality of it. They were missing that information. They were just up there with fancy words. That's all it was. The rulers transgressed against me, and the prophets prophesied by Baal. In other words, there was plenty of false prophets out there. And we're going to see a lot more of those as we work through Jeremiah. And they walk after things that do not profit. Again, taking all your time and your energy to obtain emptiness. Verse 11 and 12. Has the nation changed gods when they were not gods? But my people have changed their glory for that which does not profit. Be appalled, O heavens, at this, and shudder. Be very desolate, declares the Lord. In other words, instead of following the true God, you now have moved over to where you are following other gods. And I say, well, I don't have a single idol up in my house. I don't worship this idol. Well, gods in the sense of what is your priority in life? Is that what's become the most important? Well, that's become your god. And they're not real gods. They have changed their glory for what did not profit. It's just basically saying the same thing again they said before. He said, you go after all of these things as though they have some benefit to you, and in reality, they don't. There's no benefit whatsoever in it. Cost return analysis, a business tag. I'm going to spend X number of dollars, and in return, I'm going to get X number more back. Cost benefit. Okay? Service to our God, serving our God, following the teachings of our God, the return is huge. The failure to do so, the loss is huge. Simple. Be appalled, O heavens, at this, and shudder. Be very desolate, declares the Lord. Heaven looks down 
and it's just appalled at what's going on. Verse 13, for my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me and the, the fountain of living waters to hew for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. The two evils, the first one is they have forsaken me. In other words, the people have turned their backs on God. That's the first evil. Well, of course, everything else is going to be bad from then on. The fountain of living water, Jesus Christ says, I am the living water. Come unto me that you may never thirst again. Be filled. And instead, people take and they go after all these other things that become like water that you're pouring into a pot that is just full of holes. You're gaining nothing. You're taking the water, you're pouring it in, and it just runs out and goes to waste. We take all the blessings that God gives us and we put them into a pot and it just goes to waste. We receive nothing. Verse 17, have you not done this to yourself by your forsaking the Lord your God when he led you in the way? In other words, the suffering, these consequences are things that we brought upon ourselves. This nation is going to suffer the consequences and is because of the stupid things that are being done and it's not necessarily I'm not saying it's our leadership I'm saying it's our people because we're blessed to be in a nation in which we vote for our leadership and when we vote in people that are evil it's because we are evil verse 19 your own wickedness will correct you and your apostasies will reprove you. Know therefore and see what is evil and better and bitter. For you have forsaken the Lord your God, and the dread of me is not in you, declares the Lord God of hosts. Our wickedness in this nation and any other nation will cause a correction. In ancient times those corrections lasted four hundred years quite often long time for those corrections to take place we don't know what's going to happen I don't know what the future is God hasn't given us this road map as far as this nation or that nation it's not there but there is a general rule that a nation that does not stay faithful to our God will suffer consequences And the last line in that verse, and the dread of me is not in you. In other words, people no longer fear God. You can see things that are happening. You can hear the, the way people talk and the way people act. That there no longer is a fear of God. It's not like, oh, I can't do that because God's going to get me for it. It was incorrect theology to start with, but it's gone it's not even that's not even there I can do whatever I want I don't need to worry about if God's watching me or not that fear is God because the scripture says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of understanding it doesn't cause us to understand it leads us into that path in which we search out the truth and it's the truth that sets us free and it's sin that enslaves us so are we a nation that is desiring to become slaves or are we a nation that desires to be free slavery is in sin freedom is in Christ